All right. Thank you very much for also mingling because a very big part of uh, this kind of meetups is to just get to know each other and see what uh, uh, what your peers are working on and if you can inspire each other. Um, so if you have something uh, that you think other people will find interesting, come see me and uh, uh, I can put you on stage tonight or in another night. Um, that and the next talk is uh, from uh, Jasper on his smart bike. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Jasper. I'm a developer here at uh, Cube42. Um, I mostly work on front end and back end stuff, mostly on front end. Um, my first uh, experience with native apps and uh, both Meteor. Uh, are pretty recent, so I'm now export expert, but um, I like to uh, to share the experience. Um, that first experience was during uh, Woodcamp. That's our uh, uh, yearly hackathon at uh, Q42. Lots of fun. Uh, about 48 hours of programming, uh, caffeine, alcohol. <laughs> Not a lot of sleep, <laughs> but lots of fun. <laughs> um, with our team, uh, we made SmartBike. Um, basically, it was uh, building a Raspberry Pi um, running Node.js in a motorcycle, in that of mine and uh, Lucas. That's a mechanic working on my bike. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> Mark. He helped, him, helped us out big time because he did all the hardware stuff on the motorcycles, taking them apart, and more importantly, bringing them back together. <laughs> and they both still worked, so that's pretty thankful. Um, but the idea is that the Raspberry Pi uh, always puts up when you turn on the motorcycle and it tracks your location, uh, your speed, uh, the angle you're taking corners with, um, that kind of stuff. So when you... Oh, uh, and it has a camera on the front, so it takes a photo every couple of seconds. Um, so when you find a new nice route in a, somewhere, you always have it stored. Uh, you can share it, and um, on top of that, you can share your location and all that statistics live. So we um, redirect the data to a Meteor app Lucas made, and you can show a map with uh, all the users and where they are. So when Lucas goes uh, on tour, uh, I can get a push notification and get on my bike as well, and we can tour together. Which is more fun. So that's what that was the idea. Uh, eventually, we ran out of hardware and time, so <laughs> <laughs> not everything got made, but we uh, we got a lot. Um, yeah, these, these were the different components that we made. Um, the Pi was running Node.js. Uh, Jeroen, uh, another colleague of us, uh, made most of that stuff. It aggregates uh, data like GPS and uh, speed and angle. Um, and stores it on the device itself locally. Um, I've made a native app uh, that um, requests the data uh, over Bluetooth low energy every couple of seconds, and then it pushes the data to the web. Uh, that was Lucas' part, and uh, that receives the data and it stores it stores the data associated with the account. Um, and it shows a map of all the users and where they are and how fast they're going. Um, but back to the app. Um, like I said, it was a native app uh, in Swift, my first iOS app uh, ever. <laughs> As you can see with the glorious interface. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it uses Bluetooth low energy, um, and that's the new standard of Bluetooth, and it's especially awesome because of the low energy part. Um, and it can be so efficient as it is because um, you're sending less time, you're spending less time over the air uh, instead of constantly request, you know, requesting a device, do you have more data and give it to me? And instead of that, you can be notified when there is more data. And the data that you're sending um, is now limited to 20 bytes, which is ridiculously small. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to give an idea of the data 
this is one sample of one package. Uh, this is what we want to, to send. The, the time it is, the location, the speed, and the angle, for example. This is already way too much. <laughs> so <laughs> we changed it to something like this. And um, this is still twice too much. <laughs> it has to be hefted. And apparently, it works. We're not sure why, but it, it does. <laughs> it shouldn't work, but it still works, which is pretty awesome. Um, well, yeah, after Bootcamp, we had a working proof concept. We uh, were able to uh, get on a bike, track the location, uh, look at all the data we found, and see it live on the map. That was really awesome. Um, one downside is we didn't have any authentication. Um, on the media side, we uh, used uh, the built-in uh, Google authentication uh, login button. So we had our separate accounts, but from the app, we hard-coded the email address and just put it up there, <laughs> um, just because it would be too much work for this time period. Um, and it wasn't the, the main important thing. And um, it was iOS only, which was fine for me, but not the rest for the team. I was the only one with an iPhone. <laughs> um, until I learned about Cordova a couple of weeks later, uh, it's formerly known as PhoneGap. Um, Cordova is a tool that you can use to wrap your uh, website, so static, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and wrap it in a native app with a web view. Um, and that's about it. They support a bunch of platforms, and uh, you can wrap your web-based project in a native app and uh, deploy it to their app stores. So that's pretty cool. Um, but 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 where it gets uh, more interesting are the plugins, because these plugins um, allow you to get access to uh, the native uh, features of the device from within your JavaScript. So you have uh, access to the file system, the battery status. Uh, Dialogs is, I guess, the local push notifications thing. That's pretty cool. Um, so you can still write your web-based project and uh, interactive stuff in JavaScript, and then you get access to these things. Um, and then I saw this one. Bluetooth Low Energy for Cordova. Uh, it was originally for PhoneGap, but that's kind of the same. Um, so how would you use that? Uh, this is JavaScript. Um, as soon as you install the plugin, you get the Bluetooth Low Energy object available. Um, and you can give it the connect call uh, to callbacks for the success and error. And uh, you have to pass it the address of the device you're connecting to. This is kind of similar how it works in Swift, um, because the protocol is just the same. Um, but this is kind of cool, because you can write it in JavaScript and have access to the, the hardware. And how awesome would it be if you can do this with Meteor? Well, apparently, you already can for a couple of months. Um, Meteor has this built in. So how would you do that? You uh, go on the command line to your project. You add the platform you want. And uh, nowadays, only support iOS and Android. So you either add iOS or Android. And then you run it. So what this will do is it will run uh, the local server as it normally should or would. Um, and uh, apart, of, uh, apart from that, it also uh, launches the iOS simulator that you get from s -Code, um, which connects to the local server. And that's it. You have a native app, because it's just a web view, but still, it's a native app that connects to your local Meteor server. Um, you can also uh, run it on physical devices. So you connect your uh, device, you run uh, iOS device instead of iOS. 
Uh, that opens Xcode. And um, on the top, uh, you can select your device or any other uh, simulated devices. And then uh, it will run on your iPhone, and you get uh, the logs right in Xcode, as you, as you would with a native app. Um, Meteor does uh, another pretty cool thing. Uh, you get another environment. So uh, we, we already know Meteor is server and Meteor is client. Uh, apart from that, you get a Meteor is Cordova. And that is very similar to its client, because in fact, it is a client. But um, apart from that, you can also uh, run specific things that should only work in a Cordova environment. Is it also possible to say if it's not Cordova? Uh, I believe that is a server or is client. Well, you say that is client is printed both in browsers and mobiles. Is client and is yeah. not Cordova. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not no. sure. I'm not sure on that. Yeah. I'm not sure on that. It should be just yeah. if you can combine them, like it's closed yeah. and it's not put over. Yeah, yeah. should be, be possible. Yeah. Um, well, for the the Bluetooth thing, is uh, this would be something like it. It's kind of pseudocode, but this is the idea. Within the is Cordova scope, you can uh, do all the Bluetooth. Uh, stages you have to do to subscribe to some data. Um, yeah. And we did it, and uh, it works. Um, it's kind of awesome. And instead of <laughs> this, <laughs> instead of this, we now have this. And we can throw away a bunch of code uh, in a whole different environment. Um, and we can focus on the thing we actually already had. So especially for this stage in the project, um, I think this is the way to go. Um, we have to make some uh, exceptions for Android because they implement the Bluetooth Low Energy uh, quite differently. But those are small differences. But in theory, we can deploy uh, Android app as well in uh, relatively small work. So that's cool. Um, and we get authentication for free because it's the same app. You can log in on uh, your phone and you have access to the data and everything. So we don't have to do anything for that. Um, of course, there are some pitfalls. Uh, authentication on the device does not work. It only works in the simulator. Not sure why, I guess it that's to do with the uh, origin checks and uh, requests to the external service, so Google or Facebook or whatever. But that doesn't work, but that's OK. But Bluetooth does work in simulator. So <laughs> that was kind of messed up. I ended up uh, disabling authentication and while well, developing, and that was not cool. Um, Bluetooth low energy in the background does work, but you have to Connect it first, um, while the, the promise of Bluetooth Low Energy in iOS is that you pair the uh, device once, and when it turns on or where you get near, it automatically boots up your app, connects to it, and you can do it. But uh, it does not seem to work right now. But uh, on the other hand, I already went for a tour like two hours, and I, okay, I stopped for gas, and while the Raspberry Pi was turned off, and I turned it on, and uh, it picked up all the data, like two hours. So it does work in the in the background, but not entirely how it should be. And that's about it. Any questions? Uh, what does your interface look like now? Um, <laughs> <laughs> like the phone now. It's very basic still, but uh, yeah. Yeah. 
kan lah guys. It's kind of better, right? <laughs> and we have uh, a login state, and uh, that's it. <laughs> so, how do you how do you deploy this to a production environment? Because then you have to separately deploy your uh, server somewhere and separately to uh, to a. a to a wrapped package and mm -hmm. then configure it so that it knows where the server is. Exactly. Like that? Yeah, exactly. That yeah, uh, actually, that's the, the the best way to really test this because the one thing does work in the simulator and the other thing not. So, uh, what you do is you uh, deploy the server um, to media.com or maybe <laughs> something better, <laughs> and then uh, you build the the app with the extra flag uh, mobile server and then you enter the the server URL, okay, and then it's built to communicate with the server you deployed. Cool. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up is Martijn on his iOS GDP client. It's working. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Justin. Seems to be working. Awesome. OK, um, I'm uh, Martijn um, And um, I'd like to show you something I've been working on for a while. Um, it's a, um, a DDP client for iOS. Um, I released it uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, especially after the last talk, maybe one of the first questions that comes to mind is, why would you do this? Um, I'm an iOS developer, and I, I really prefer building native apps. I, I think especially for, um, let's say, real apps, it, it, it's still hard to recreate uh, the feeling of a native app using web technologies. Um, and with a, with, a, um, with, a, with a back-end technology like Meteor, it's actually really easy to build a complete app um, using native components. Um, maybe the best way to demonstrate that is with a quick uh, with a quick example. So this is the standard Meteor uh, to-dos. And I hope this works. Whoa. Doesn't seem to work. It worked before. Let's see. Ah, there it is. Mm. Oh. Let's fit them both here. Um, so this is a native app um, using the VDDP client. It connects to the same, um, same Meteor app deployed on Meteor.com. And um, I'll show you some code later. But um, it's actually really simple once it works. Um, so. You can see it's loading. Um, it actually caches subscriptions with a configurable timeout. Um, and let's see, this is the same list. So I select one here, one here, one here. Um, the connection is actually really fast, but there is latency compensation. So um, it immediately updates on 
um, in this case, the native client, um, and only at a later point, um, it uh, updates the, the, the web app. Um, I can also um, add stuff, of course. Um, maybe there's a slight delay if I add it here. It's still pretty fast. Sorry, Wi Fi is too fast. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I can also delete them, of course. Um, um, let's see, I can add lists. I can log in. No. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the one I normally use. Um, let's see. So what I, what I can do now, actually, is um, make this private. This is just a feature of the standard example app. So if I make this private, um, it hides from the other one. Um, you can see the private icon here. Um, so I, it's gone here, but I can log in here as well. That's there. Um, and if I log out here, um, so. <laughs> Well, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and someone else seems to have added another list. Is that? Yeah, it works. <laughs> yeah, I was actually hoping for more people would open laptops. That would have made for a better demo. Um, but um, I mean, this is the kind of demo you see with Meteor all the time. Um, but what's really exciting is how easy it is to do this within a native app. Um, so there's a short list of features of what, what really um, makes this DDP client work. Um, I, I mentioned latency compensation. Um, it's actually really easy to make a DDP client. If you're just listening to data coming in, uh, I mean, the protocol itself is fairly simple. Um, all you need to do is store the data somewhere, um, invoke methods, uh, et cetera. But the latency compensation is the hard part. Um, I um, underestimated this. I, I spent months working on this, and I really didn't see that coming because I got it working so, um, so, so, so fast. I actually got a first version working within a couple of days, and then I spent, I think, four or five months um, getting to the point where I am now. Um, so latency compensation is the hard part. Um, if it works, you don't uh, notice that there's a lot of synchronization going on, uh, methods mod modifying documents concurrently. Uh, waiting for results, uh, etc. How scalable is DB? I mean, is this about the same scalability as web server to uh, web client to server that's natively in Meteor? Or? It depends on what you mean by scalable, but on the server side, there's no difference. Um, it's just any other DDP client. So there's no difference between a web app client and a native client. Um, you can scale to infinite amount of iPads, of course. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, actually, you, you might be able to do more on the client side, but that's not something I, I mean, that's not really within the DDP protocol. Um, core data is an important part. I'll um, talk about that separately later. Um, but also, um, once you have a, a native app, um, one of the first things you try to do is not uh, use the main thread at all. Uh, the main thread is the thread that you use for user interface updates. On JavaScript, you're usually single-threaded. Um, but on native apps, um, especially network communication, but um, basically anything you can get away with doing on another thread, you will uh, try to uh, avoid doing on the main thread. Um, so the, the, the DDP clients actually does all processing off the main thread. Um, it only has to. Um, uh, perform code on the main thread once you use it to update the user interface. Um, there's also the issue with change notifications. Um, the standard interface for Meteor gives you a callback uh, for every change. And that's something you don't want to do 
um, if you're updating a native uh, user interface on a separate thread. So it, 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 it posts uh, change notifications in batches, and it also consolidates the changes. So if uh, something changes back, for instance, to its original value, there's no change at all in the end. So it only gives you the changes that actually happen. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with iOS at all. <laughs> um, but core data basically is a model layer framework. Um, it, it, it's often described as a, as, a, as a data layer or a database layer, but it's, it's more than that. It's, um, and it's not necessarily connected to a database. So what it gives you is uh, a way of um, interacting with objects, um, keeping track of changes, uh, managing relationships for you. Uh, and then usually, um, those objects are connected to a database, let's say a SQLite database. That's the, the, the standard storage. Um, so what the DDP client does is it, um, it implements an interface that's defining core data that you can use to, um, to implement your own storage backend. Uh, it connects to the, the, the client interface and over DDP, over a WebSocket to the server. Um, and once you have this uh, configured, you can use all the features of core data. Uh, and I think most useful, I mean, there's, there's type safety, which is obviously, well, obviously, but can be important. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but relationships are, um, if you're dealing with Mongo, um, you're, you're used to um, traversing relationships manually, performing separate queries uh, based on IDs. Um, within core data, like, like other object relational mapping frameworks or uh, object uh, layers. Um, you actually define entities, relationships, uh, and the relationships can be of different types, one to one, one to many. Uh, and you traverse relationships um, within code as if these were all just uh, in-memory objects. And the core data layer takes care of asking um, the store for um, values for different relationships. And that means that, um, just show you some code, just to give you a quick, at least some feeling for how this could be used. Um, the framework itself is written in Objective-C. I um, actually started before Swift came out, and there was some issues with Swift. Uh, but that the project I'm using it for, um, I switched all over to Swift, um, and I think um, I, I've been defining some some helper classes, extensions uh, that make it easier to um, to interact with it. This is all Swift, um, and what happens here is um, I've defined some standard books uh, in view controllers. If you're familiar with iOS, just different screens or parts of screens, um, and at some point, um, you get asked to load content. Um, and you can just subscribe to a Meteor subscription. Uh, you can actually pass an object. You don't have to pass an ID. The ID gets extracted from the object automatically. Um, and a loading manager takes care of um, um, waiting for all subscriptions that you've added to finish to get ready. It also. Um, like I mentioned, uh, it caches subscriptions, so uh, and and, and subscriptions are, are um, shared. So if you subscribe to the same subscription uh, more than once, uh, only one subscription request gets sent. Um, and then once all subscriptions um, uh, become ready, um, you use standard methods on uh, in core data, and these are these are some helper functions I use. Um, but basically, what this does is it connects table view um, to the result of database query. In this case, just um, give me all to-dos that belong to a certain list sorted by creation date. Um, and this is all that is needed to get the reactivity. Um, so this is all, code, all the code that was needed in the demo. Uh, and you get the animations for free. Um, you get everything for free. The, the, so the table view <coughs> in iOS, the table view is, is, is already reacted. Well, there's an easy way to make it reactive. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, you can add multiple subscriptions, like I mentioned. Uh, here it's public lists and private lists. And what's so nice about Meteor is that, for instance, I didn't have to do anything to deal with the, the logged in, logged out state. Uh, Meteor, when you log in, 
um, because you've already subscribed to private lists and it's reactive on the server side based on user ID, um, it just sends me more lists. Uh, and when I log out, it removes them again. Um, so on, on the client side, it's, it's really simple. Um, making changes. Um, Basically, this is, this is the same code you would use with a database backend in core data. Um, uh, so you just set certain properties, uh, relationships, you can set them, um, and then you save it, and it's immediately, um, it, it, it executes the, the, the insert method on the Meteor backend in this case. And with latency compensation, so the, the changes are immediately reflected in memory, um, and um, only if the server returns a different result than the one you uh, suspected, uh, there will be another change. Um, you can also call methods, um, again, with object parameters. Um, and what's, what's really nice about just using Meteor in general, but, but if, if you're used to other ways of developing applications, um, you don't manually uh, change the, the, the selected state of the like button, for instance, here. Um, there's one single source of truth, and that's the data Meteor sends you. Um, so within your, for instance, a, a toggle function that gets executed when you press the like button, um, you just call a method, that's answer like by user, or remove answer like, like by user, and that results in a change in your data. And you detect that change, and then you update your likes button. So you don't get weird um, synchronization problems or out-of-date state, uh, inconsistent state. And you can define your own, uh, your own methods. Um, so that's a, that's a really quick overview of um, what this is capable of. Um, I think it would be interesting to well, hear some questions or comments, or maybe you think it's crazy to want to develop native apps if you can develop all JavaScript. Um. <laughs> How do you handle offline? <laughs> hmm? How do you handle offline? Offline. Um, it actually, um, th there are some limitations to the DDP protocol. Um, so I've tried to handle it as, as, as well as possible. Um, the data is in memory. Uh, so w have, w once, you, once you get it, it's in, it's in memory. If you lose the connection, it stays in memory. Um, it tries to reconnect um, based on uh, based on the timeout and the, the network status, etc. Um, once you get new connection, um, it takes care to um, first get all your ready subscriptions back again, and then only uh, notify you of things that actually changed. So there's no flash or anything, um, but you still need an initial network connection. Uh, there is no, at this moment, there's no storage. There's no not in memory storage. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, if you really from your offline. Yeah, it will actually, it, it will queue all the method requests. So, you will not see it when you're in the Well, you will see it immediately uh, locally. Uh, and once you reconnect, it will send it to the server. Uh, but of course, mm -hmm. if you somehow quit your replication, uh, before it gets a chance to send that message, um, uh, your changes will be lost. So that's something that either within your user interface or some other store your queue somewhere, or there, there are different solutions possible. Is there any conflict handling? How do you mean conflict handling? Uh, server and client updated while they were offline, thus generating a conflict with the update. Well, the thing with Meteor is that there's, I mean, the single source of truth is the server. Yes, uh, the server of well, I mean, you could do conflict handling on the server with optimistic yeah. blocking or something, but in general, it's it's all time based, and the yeah. server is the source of time. Also, a last change probably. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? What um, What did you build this for? Did have you built an application on top of it, <laughs> apart from the to do list? Yeah, <laughs> and I'm, I'm still. I was actually hoping to demo it here, but it's not ready yet. Um, but it's um, it's actually an, an education app, so it's it's interesting. It's it's somewhat similar, not completely, <laughs> but to the previous talk. Um, <laughs> nice. So maybe maybe for another talk. Awesome.
Thanks. Awesome. Great. awesome. Okay, last talk is Marcel. Yes. He has been working on WebGL. Web, WebGL. 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 Sounds better in Dutch. Oh, um, crap. Just a sec. Why is it not working? This is a uh, HD mine. That is strange. Uh, is that from the Yeah, it's just detected. Yes, I have some there. No, yes. Well, not only the rest of the DVD, Yeah, definitely. Ah, there we go. Okay. I'm not touching it. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Marcel. Uh, I'm an engineer at Q42. Um, I specialize mainly in uh, web front end, so uh, a lot of uh, graphical things. And one of my things that I like a lot is uh, WebGL 3D graphics. Uh, I don't know if any of you have worked with it before. Hands mm -hmm. or. Cool. Uh, does anyone not know what what uh, what, uh, what it is? That's great. Um, yeah. So um, this is kind of like more like comic relief in comparison to to the other talks. Uh, I'll just give a small demo of a software thing that uh, me and a few colleagues have been working on. Uh, just uh, purely as an experiment, I wanted to see uh, how Meteor could be combined with WebGL with a dynamic uh, 3D scene and how the performance would be. So. Um, yeah, th this was basically the main question to start the project. Is it possible? Of course it's possible, but how, how does it work and how does it feel? Um, this is, uh, we call it Safe Haven, uh, created during our own project time. We get a few hours every week to, uh, to do our own things. Um, and basically what it is is, uh, well, it uses, of course, Meteor, WebGL, and uh, it uses 3.js 3 for WebGL, it's, so it's not native. Uh, and uh, there's some JavaScript uh, encryption included, which is not really functional yet. But it's really cool. Uh, now in JavaScript, you can uh, use uh, all kind of uh, encoding and decoding algorithms like SHA-256 and a lot more. Uh, so that's really cool. Um, the main cost to, uh, or the main idea behind the project was to type uh, as little code uh, as needed to get a fully operating app instead of reinventing the wheel uh, constantly. So we're just using. Uh, the maximum of what all these uh, things uh, offer. So, um, yeah, I didn't really have time to make a huge presentation, so I'll just give a demo. This was a <laughs> All right, um, this is a WebGL scene. It's just a skybox and uh, a WASD controls. And what have we made? We have made a few saves. A colleague has made a, cute, a cool uh, a 3D model. And what it basically is, it's, it's kind of like a fun project uh, where we want to enable users without logging in to enter a safe and just put anything in there. Uh, right now, it's only text-based. Uh, text you can only put uh, 256 uh, characters uh, in it. Uh, so yeah, you can use it to store your passwords or whatever. But the cool thing actually uh, is um, the world is unlimited. Uh, it, it can be as big as, uh, as you want it to be. And if there are many saves, then uh, you can pick your own safe and claim it as your own and put a password on it. Uh, uh, all the encryption is done client-side, so there's no uh, uh, server 
uh, encryption or decryption. So uh, actually, uh, if I would make a data dump of the MongoDB uh, database, I cannot ever uh, decrypt uh, the, the code because everything is done in the client. Um, and the cool thing is um, you have to remember in your head where your safe is stored. So if there are <laughs> 5,000 safes, then you can just say, OK, my safe is uh, third row, uh, 15th from the left, uh, uh, things like that. So that's actually a pretty funny way uh, to, to hide your own data. Um, yeah, so this is what it looks like. Um, well, I've been goofing around a little. It's, it's kind of like Minecraft. Um, and you can actually enter a safe. And this is yet to be built. Um, but here uh, will be the interface where you can just, uh, in the end, uh, just drag and drop files, uh, put images, objects, whatever, uh, and where you can interact with your, uh, with your data. Um, and then, of course, you can just return to the real world and things like that. So it's, it's, it's very, very, very simple. Well, you can create saves very easily. Uh, just one time C, it, it creates a ghost. And if that's OK with you, another time C. And with R, you can remove it uh, if it's not used yet. Um, this is basically it. But the cool thing is, um, in my mind, this is a graphical representation of the database. Uh, because the database is very, very simple. Um, it's just a safe object with an x, y, z coordinate, and uh, which is yet to be built. Of course, which data is inside it, which will be 256 bytes at first. And that's, that's really basically it. And um, there are different areas. This is currently the only area available. Uh, but we're going to build different worlds. And you can create your own world where you can store your own saves and stuff like that. So we thought of practices like, uh, for instance, you're working with a customer and you want to, sh to share some demo URLs or passwords. You can just. Uh, Give them a save <laughs> and, <it's> like, <laughs> and put a sticker on it, like like this is this is their save. Um, and the interesting thing is, uh, of course, performance. How many saves can you put in one world, uh, and that it, it still keeps performing well? And how many users can you uh, put there simultaneously um, without uh, a lot of lag? Uh, currently, the only thing uh, updated to the server is whether or not uh, someone is watching, uh, is actually inside a safe. Uh, our 3D uh, artist still has to <coughs> make a separate door for the safe object so that the door actually opens. It's still a, a minor detail. Um, but it's really interesting to see uh, what if there are 100 users uh, simultaneously. Uh, will we send to the server where those users are, the coordinates? Will, will you be able to see the other users or not? Um, we. We haven't implemented that yet. Uh, but maybe there's not really a reason to do such a thing, I think. Uh, it would be nice to see other, other people walking around, uh, around and being able to chat. But that's, that's like a nice to have. This is more like uh, a nice proof of concept for something really, really, really secure. Uh, we can never, ever uh, know what's inside the safe, except the users with the passwords uh, know that. Um, fun fact, uh, I also want to create a safe where you actually have to use the dial uh, and, and like go five right, three left, uh, 10 right. And uh, that I want that to be a password as well. Uh, uh, because it would be awesome to have like an Oculus Rift and, and, and using this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, why not? And so today, um, <laughs> yeah. Have you, have you been talking to our neighbors? Uh, we transfers around the, oh. around the border. Oh, really? No, 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 not yet. Well, it would be nice, yeah, just to get a safe. And, uh, there's also like the possibility of, of gamification to open a safe, like uh, a logical puzzle, uh, a binary puzzle, or whatever, just to make it hard for people to to enter your safe, but not impossible. So, so you can make like a, uh, a a hunting game where you have to find a certain safe within a certain time. Um, so today, actually, um, today, yesterday, I did the first deploy to Meteor.com, uh, <laughs> and I asked a few colleagues today to play around just to see <laughs> what they could come up with. <laughs> and they made a lot in, in, in maybe half an hour time. Um, but it shows that the concept works, because people actually use it to, to build stuff. And each of these saves is accessible like this. So actually, I can just pick one save and, uh, and use it. Or I can just play Minecraft and, and build huge worlds. <laughs> um, Let's How see. should you remember where your safe is if all the safes around it keep changing? Yeah, that, that's still some things that we have to think about. 
but, but, but the whole idea is. <laughs> Oh, that's your set. Let me front. That's what we have to think about. <laughs> Definitely. But uh, we also want to enable users to create their own worlds, of course, and 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 choose from a few like templates, uh, like a Wild Western <laughs> Bank and a Wall Street Bank. And uh, uh, this is like a sci-fi uh, world. Um, but I, I think it's just really nice. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, there's my name. <laughs> I didn't make that. Um, but these are actually uh, uh, near to, what was it? I think 2,500 saves. And the performance is really, really, really good. Um, uh, when they were building, I could really see uh, all the real time updates. Um, I use uh, Meteor's Observe Changes uh, to uh, get all the changes. Um, and so uh, um, that method only uh, receives the deltas in the changes. So if a JavaScript object is updated, uh, it only receives the updated uh, values. Uh, that means it's really low bandwidth. And because your uh, position isn't uh, being streamed uh, to the others, it's, it's really a, a, a low bandwidth uh, app. Um, so I think that's the reason that it, that it will scale really well. And I really uh, want to do some experiments uh, in like pre-generating worlds with uh, 10,000 uh, cubes or states or whatever. And. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll publish it, and, and, and uh, it will be a blog post on Q42, so keep that in mind. Um, any questions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Like Not yet, because um, I, I have to build. Uh, I still have to build the entire input uh, method. Still, but uh, that's indeed a very good question. Uh, uh, what if two people are editing the contents at the same time, which takes pre uh, precedence? Um, I don't know yet. I think maybe a save will just be locked if someone is uh, inside it and updating the data. Um, but I'm, I'm I'm not too sure. But this is a very good question. Um, we're yet to find out. <laughs> so yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. What did made you actually add to this? I mean, well, um, I don't have to think about any server. That's the great thing. Um, uh, I've made sure that it only uh, that, that that the data transaction is very minimal, um, and I get a lot of, a lot of stuff for free. Mm -hmm. uh, like mo multiple users in this world, I, I didn't even have to think about that. Uh, it, it, it's it's already there. Um, <coughs> So yeah, th that's why uh, I, I really, I really uh, started loving Meteor because of this. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Thank you all very much for joining. You've just had a shitload of different information uh, uh, box your ears. So uh, uh, take the, some time to let that settle, and um, you can take. Uh, a little time here to uh, uh, talk around and get to know each other and um, uh, see if there's interesting people who are working on stuff that's uh, related to what you're working on. Um, on the next Meteor talk, what, the, um, what, would, what would be topics to discuss on that next Meteor talk? Um, Let's save that discussion for uh, when we uh, grab a beer now and also continue on the meetup.com forum um, uh, because I would like to give you the information that you're looking for. Um, so ask those questions on the forum and um, uh, if you have something that you want to demo that's just fun like this or that's interesting or that's technical uh, advanced, then uh, let me know and I'll put you on the, uh, up on stage. Next time. Yeah, anything to add? Oh, good. Cool. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you.